Hello everyone, my name is Piotr Kłaczkowski uh, and I got a talk on storage attached indexes that are coming into Cassandra 5.0. Uh, I hope that uh, the feature that I present will solve at least some of those problems that were described just in the talk before from Verizon uh, about data modeling. Um, so, yeah, when I started my experience with, with Cassandra, I remember that I, that I did some trainings, I gave some trainings to people who were mostly aware of relational databases, but Cassandra was new to them uh, in those days. Well, I'm, I'm talking about, well, times 10 years ago when I just was starting working for Datastax. And uh, I showed them SQL language. Uh, they were very excited because uh, the syntax is kind of familiar. Like it's almost like SQL, right? I mean, you got create table, you got select, update, delete. I mean, they said like, why, why do this training? We already know this, right? And then we started doing some exercises uh, and they quickly created something similar to this. Maybe the example was slightly different, but uh, well, simple table with a few columns. And then they tried to do this select. Here we got a column which is color. It's not a primary key. And uh, it turns out that when they try this, they got this. <laughs> and uh, what is that? <laughs> um, yeah, it took me a while to explain what allow filtering is. But this talk is, of course, not about allow filtering and how it works, but mostly how to avoid this. Uh, so. Yeah, in order to fix this problem, Cassandra originally offers a few solutions already. Like one solution is, of course, to do uh, what is suggested by this error message. Uh, the error message tells you, okay, use allow filtering. Um, yeah, you can do this, but uh, it is useful only in a very small subset of um, use cases. Uh, if uh, you're filtering low amounts of data, that would be probably fine. The problem with filtering is that the filtering happens on the uh, server side or both on the coordinator and, and the replica level. But if there are many, many rows to filter out, you might, well, traverse thousands of rows before you even hit one live row that you need to return to the client. In this case, uh, it's very likely that you run into timeout issues. And even if not timeouts, then the queries will be simply slow and consume a lot of resources, this won't work very well. Uh, another idea, which was already presented also in the pre previous talk from Verizon, you can normalize by hand, so like create separate tables. Uh, each table serves, uh, stores the same data, but in different order. Uh, and then uh, you can direct your queries to proper tables that are laid out in such a way that uh, you always query by the primary key. And in this case, it is fast, but it also has some operational problems like, well, consistency. You're also duplicating a lot of data. So actually you need to prepare space for the data. Um, there is a feature called materialized views that is supposed to automate some of that, uh, but uh, current implementation also runs into some consistency and operational uh, issues. So uh, it might work for you, but not always. And then there is a bunch of indexing options in Cassandra. Uh, there are legacy uh, Cassandra uh, 2i indexes, secondary indexes, uh, which are um, unfortunately working in a very similar way, like creating a separate table locally on each node. Um, so, so they also have some problems. Uh, they're pretty limited in features. Like for example, uh, as I remember, there are no range scans and it cannot, you cannot use multiple indexes in the same query for, on, on multiple columns. Um, then there is SASE, which is a bit more modern, still a bit experimental, and also has its limitation that you cannot put multiple um, columns, index columns in the same uh, expression on a single query. And now the feature that I'm presenting, so SAI, storage attached indexing. Uh, this is uh, a big improvement over previous indexes. It doesn't solve all of the problems probably, but I guess that it should be good enough. Um, okay, the basic syntax is very simple. Um, 
create index, you just need to specify using SAI uh, to tell the database that, that you want to use this kind of index. And there is an option, like in the Cassandra YAM, you can set uh, default secondary index enabled true. In that case, your statement could be simply create index and it would automatically choose uh, SAI. Okay, so let's see uh, this example again, like with indexes. Of course, it works. Uh, it returns all yellow fruit. Um, returning yellow fruit is a very important problem. Like for anyone who has kids, uh, probably knows that uh, they have various preferences, not just on the taste of the food, but also the color. For example, my youngest son won't touch anything that is red. It uh, doesn't matter if it's tasty or not. Red can't do. Uh, so yeah, this way we can just get all the yellow fruit, but what about uh, if we wanted, well, lemon is, is probably not a good thing here. I, I, I mean, my son would say, okay, I, I, I like yellow, but lemons are yellow, but I don't like lemons. So please give me meal without lemons. So we need to add another condition. Uh, so for example, bananas are okay. In this case, this works with SAI. So you can use multiple indexed columns. Uh, the system would intersect two indexes and uh, it will return proper result. Uh, we also get range queries. Range queries currently work on numeric data types. Uh, there is a plan to support them on all data types uh, in the future. Um, and of course you can mix range queries together with um, just uh, equality uh, queries as well. So as uh, in the previous example, I mean, this is all, this all composes pretty well. Um, those queries are also pretty fast. Like, I mean, it goes directly to the index, fetches just some sub range of the uh, a tree and uh, yeah, I'll show later how it's, how it's uh, executed. Uh, but there is no filtering. That's the most important part of it. Mm. Collections. SAI also works for collections. So we know that Cassandra supports lists, maps, sets. Um, so that's a bit more complex uh, because, for example, maps have both values and keys. Um, so you can create, for, for lists and sets, it is easy. You just create an index on the column as usual and then you can ask, uh, like, please give me rows where the collection contains given value. Uh, for maps, it's a bit more complex because you have uh, this additional syntax. Uh, you can tell it, like, do, do, wh which part of the map you want to index. Is it keys, is it values, or more, maybe both, keys and values. And if you create proper index uh, on, on the map, then you can also ask queries, like for example, give me entries which contain given key or which contain given value or where there is a specific value associated with a specific key. So in this case, actually the index would be constructed on both keys and values, on key value pairs, and it would be used to search for given pair. And if it finds in the index, then it will return the row. Uh, yeah, here's the example. So we have a bunch of maps uh, and uh, then we create an index uh, on keys uh, of those uh, ingredients uh, maps. Uh, and as you can see, the query with contains key keys returns just the items uh, with uh, keys. Okay, let's look at how it's implemented. So generally a secondary index is a data structure that uh, allows you to associate some indexed term with uh, a list of uh, rows. Actually it's a list of the pointers to the rows. So like the index is not really duplicating uh, the row data, it's just storing the uh, ID identifiers, uh, row identifiers. Uh, and uh, of course, with a single indexed term, uh, with a single value, uh, there can be more than one row associated. So like in this map example, let's go back. You can see that uh, for cheese, like we have two items, two rows. So in the index, we have uh, one term cheese and, and posting list. The posting list is a list of, of row IDs. Um, 
So we, we get two rows associated with that. That is, of course, a very, very simplified view. It's, it's just a high-level overview. In reality, the data structures that we use are a bit more complex. Uh, so how we do that in the phys physically in the database? Each SS table and each mem table has an associated index. That index is just the data that we inserted into that SS table or mem table. So those are not global indexes. Those are local to SS tables or local to, to, to MEM tables. Um, this makes it very easy for us to keep the data consistent because indexes have the same life cycle as SS tables. So whenever Cassandra flashes a new SS table, we build an index for it. And it's immutable, like the SS table itself. When the SS table gets compacted, eventually it gets deleted. The index gets deleted as well. Um, and of course, we get the index data already in the new compacted SS table. Um, so this is very easy to, to get consistency. Um, each index, and this is uh, something unique to SAI. SASE didn't have this. Uh, each index is actually a set of files. It's not a one file. And we get two types of files, two types of components of the index. One type of component is per SS table files. So we, we realize that some data that we want to index uh, are actually common for all the indexes um, on this particular SS table. So like if you want to create three indexes on three columns of SS table, some data actually would be common. Uh, I mean, data like primary keys, we need to store them only once. So there's no point in repeating that data and duplicating the data in each, uh, with it, in each column index. We store it once and all the column indexes use that data. So this is, per S, this is what we call per SS table index files. And of course, each indexed column also has some components. Uh, well, that is typically the tri structure or tree based structure that allows us to quickly map between index term and, um, and um, uh, row ID. Uh, when we're writing data uh, to an indexed uh, table, uh, the data goes as usual to mem table and commit log. And for mem table, we also have mem table index. Uh, so when the mem table fills up and there's time to flush, the mem table gets flushed into SS table and the mem table index is also literally copied to a, a SS table index uh, component. Uh, this process is fairly straightforward and, and, straightly, uh, and, and, and uh, quite efficient. Mm. Of course, the whole flash happens asynchronously, similar to like just, just traditional uh, way how Cassandra does flashes. Um, okay, eventually the SS, table, SS tables need to be compacted. And here, uh, there are two ways that we could achieve the same, same effect. Currently, what we are doing is like after the SS tables get compacted, uh, the, uh, the compaction uh, uh, creates, uh, well, writes new rows to, to, to an output as a stable. We register a listener uh, on those rows and we feed those rows to the index builder and this index builder basically builds a fresh index uh, from those rows. Uh, we are not compacting the indexes. Uh, that is an alternative solution that uh, we are investigating, uh, that we believe that in future would be faster to actually take just the indexes and compact them together instead of building a fresh index from a stable data. Currently, you might notice some uh, slowdown uh, because of that indexing building on compaction. So we don't recommend creating too many indexes um, per table. Like 10 is okay, but don't go far to like don't go too far uh, beyond that because uh, yeah it might slow down uh, compaction a bit. Um, this is this is of course a, the index building uh, is done synchronously uh, because uh, we need to have fully operational index before the SS table is marked as uh, usable in the system. Uh, read path. 
Mm, well, for read paths, because each index is local to mem table and SS tables, we have to, of course, consult all of them. Uh, so first the query goes to each index. Uh, it returns an iterator over, uh, over primary keys. Again, a simplification. This is a multi-stage process to get a list of primary keys. Um, so we get a primary keys. One nice thing about this uh, model that Cassandra uses is that all SS tables are actually sorted. And they're sorted in the same way. They're sorted by token and clustering. Uh, so because they are sorted, it's very easy to merge them. Uh, and uh, then after we are merging them, we get a list of, well, all primary keys from, from on, on that node. And then we just go to the storage and fetch data, fetch row, fetch rows by, uh, by the primary keys. Um, this version uh, of SAI that uh, goes into Apache Cassandra so as a part of CP7 uh, is uh, um, row aware. So it actually indexes exactly rows, not partitions. We had earlier, we had an internal version of uh, SAI uh, that uh, actually indexed just partitions. It was a bit easier because we didn't have to store primary keys, we just needed to store tokens. So in some use cases, it was a bit faster, uh, but uh, well, if you had wide partitions, uh, it was not good because it had to you know, filter all the data of a partition. Here, this is much more precise and this is going into Apache Cassandra. Um, well, one more thing, there's post filter block after. So after retrieving the rows, we still need to filter out, uh, so like recheck if the row matches uh, the selection criteria because indexes do not track deletions. So uh, like if you have tombstones, um, so yeah, tombstones of course track deletions, but this is for, for Cassandra for like primary keys. And here, uh, because we, we don't record uh, deletions, we might hit some false positives. And that's why we are post filtering them to return correct results. Uh, okay, what if we have a query involving multiple columns? So like here we have column name, column quantity. Then we just open an iterator on one index for, for name, we open iterator on quantity. After merging, then we, uh, we have another block uh, that's intersecting two iterators. Uh, so basically it returns only the primary keys that were present in both of the iterators. Again, because the order is the same, it's easy to, to do this operation. However, however, there are some costs involved. So imagine that uh, those index indexes on both sides return just a very tiny subset of rows. Uh, you had one million rows, for example, but each return just 10 rows. So, uh, Whenever you get one item from, from the left index here, um, you have to find if, if there is a matching entry on the right one, on the right iterator. So we have internally some kind of uh, uh, well, skipping operation. It's actually called skip to. So uh, we, instead of, instead of just fetching all the things from both iterators and, and, and comparing naively, uh, we just ask the second index uh, like, hey, can you move forward to the point uh, with this primary key? If this primary key is not found, of course, give me the next available ones. And uh, this operation is a bit costly, but again, it's still often faster than just going through all the entries. Because like if one index was very, very selective and another one was not very selective, like one index, for example, was something like a Boolean flag, you can index Boolean here, right? True or false, 50% might match. Right? So if you had that, then you would probably not, it, it, the, 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 another index that is very selective wouldn't be any good because you would still have to go through all the entries on the other side. So that's why we have the skip operation, which in this case skips forward um, by many items uh, much faster without, without going through the data file. Um, but of course, be worried that if you put multiple columns in, in a query, those intersections, they do cost a bit more performance. So it's not as fast as, as selecting from one column. 
And yeah, the detailed uh, stuff. So like I said that the index returns a list of primary keys. That's not exactly like it is done. So this process has multiple stages. So first the, well, we, we have actually two types of indexes. So we have try-based index. This is for string data, so for, for literal uh, data. Uh, this is because tries uh, have this nice property of compressing prefixes very well. So like if you have a lot of, lot of text, then all the prefixes would be actually stored once in the try. Uh, this is the same data structure as uh, Cassandra is using for memtables, which was already presented by Brian Emery earlier today. Uh, and uh, for uh, numeric indexes, we use some kind of KD tree. This is not exactly KD tree. It's a KD tree with one dimension, this block balanced tree, but the structure is very similar. So it's basically a tree with some blocks on the leaves and each block packs uh, some 1024 uh, items probably, if I'm not mistaken. But this is just a detail. Uh, so we get just row IDs from those either try or, or the KD tree. Row ID is just a sequential number of the row in the table. Uh, because as a stable is immutable, we can just count rows from zero. Uh, this was designed like that because also those numbers are very small, so they compress very well. Like we don't need to store very big numbers. Like if we stored full primary keys in the try, that would take up much more space and that would be also much slower to search for. Um, so we store just row IDs and then we use a per SS table component, which is only once. It's, common, it's a common component for all the column indexes on the SS table. Then we do the translations from uh, translation from row IDs to actual primary keys. So we have several, several map, like row ID to token map, row ID to partition key, and row ID to clustering key. Uh, we have separate maps because often we don't need to actually map row ID to a full primary key. Sometimes it's enough to just map it to the token, uh, because when we are doing comparisons, uh, we can first compare by token. If the token don't match, there's no point in fetching the partition keys or clustering keys, uh, because that's also a costly operation. Um, so that's why those structures got separated. Um, and uh, then when we have the primary key, then we of course can go to storage and, and fetch the data. Mm, okay, uh, why SAI also improves over SASE and, and, and previous uh, indexing uh, technology? So we actually did a lot of, uh, we use a lot of compression, data compression techniques in, in how we design the indexes. So using row IDs is one example, using per SS table component is, is another example, like not repeating the data, um, so, so avoiding redundancy at all costs. Uh, but also we we try to be very smart in like data encoding. So, for example, instead of like uh, remembering when in posting list, instead of remembering all the uh, row IDs, uh, we can like like if the table is small, for example, we we we, we don't need to use you know long integers for for them. Like those integers are smaller, so we can actually bit pack them. Uh, if they are bigger. Well, that's still not a problem. We can do something like delta encoding. So deltas between the rows are actually much smaller numbers than the absolute values themselves. So this way we can actually store much smaller integers and then use bit packed encoding. So those, all those things uh, together, they, they, they play very well, they amplify. Uh, so like using just a single technique, maybe won't win a lot, uh, but all together, yeah, it works very well. A block packed frame of reference, so actually storing data in blocks, and each block is something like a you know, base number, for example, like, like a value that other stuff is just delta encoded from that. Uh, and also all the uh, things within the block, for example, are using just five bits for integer. And we just store the, 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 the number five bits is stored just once per block in, in the metadata uh, segment. So uh, those things, uh, result in much better disk usage overall. So here's a comparison uh, with 10 column indexes on the same SS table, uh, on the same table, sorry. And uh, we can see that, well, there's the, the, the difference in, in disk usage is massive. Uh, this also translates to performance increase because the less data you have to fetch from disk, of course, uh, the faster it is. 
Uh, as for throughput, of course, it's very dependent on the type of query, as I said. Like, if you do a lot of intersections, it will be slower. It, I mean, you can't expect the same level of performance as you get from uh, primary key lookups in Cassandra. That's really hard to beat. <laughs> Cassandra is so fast that uh, not, not many databases actually, you know, can compete with it. Uh, so, so here, uh, the performance of, would be, of course, slower than primary key lookups, but it's still much faster than uh, filtering. Uh, and uh, for um, simple reads, like read unique, this is a benchmark which just reads uh, one row uh, from uh, using just one column. Uh, we can see that it's still in tens of thousands per second. This is on a single node. Uh, but this benchmark is just a single node benchmark. Uh, when you do the ranges, it's in thousands, but if you do like intersections, uh, which we have uh, like different types of cardinalities, like low cardinality columns, high cardinality columns, we get a lot of different variants of those benchmarks. You can see that, of course, the performance is slower, but it's still in the hundreds uh, per second. So overall, if you look at latency, you can still most of the time be below like, you know, 20 milliseconds and, and often below 10 milliseconds, which is fairly good enough. Um, Okay, so the last slide, what can come next? Uh, there is a work uh, quite advanced on, on adding not operators, so negative queries, not in, not contains, not contains key, not equals. Uh, that's uh, currently in review mostly, there are just minor fixes uh, required. Uh, then, well, indexing frozen collections, uh, range queries on map values, uh, so general range queries on, on other data types is what I said in the beginning, that we actually want to just remove the limitations. We know that there are some gaps still, so, so, so that might come in the future. Uh, maybe also adding OR operator, like if we have both NOT and OR and AND, I could do, well, arbitrary nested expressions. Uh, this looks already like an RDBMS, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, and uh, another thing, th that's one missing point from SASE. Actually, SASE does that. So SASE has like support. Uh, SAI currently doesn't. Uh, but this is also like an idea that, that we might want to investigate in the future. Like doing uh, full text search, maybe prefix search or suffix search. Thank okay, you. thank you. Uh, yeah, literal text counts with text, yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. And uh, if you want to collaborate on this, I mean, this is all open source, right? So there's uh, ASF channel, uh, Cassandra Sai, and uh, there's also documentation already out there, so you can see actually the preview. Thank you. I take any questions if there is still a bit, a minute. <laughs> Okay, so the question is about how extensively we tested uh, performance uh, of this on, on, on some, well, on, on, on what kind of workloads. Uh, so, okay, yeah, we have a set of synthetic tests for SAI. So those are basically, th this slide what I showed, this is a subset of those tests. Uh, there are many more. So actually loading a billion of rows uh, and, uh, or, well, yeah, a billion of rows, exactly. So, so on, and loading that into a cluster and, and measuring latencies, measuring throughputs. Uh, we have this uh, Fallout system. By the way, Fallout is also open source. So this is a distributed performance testing system that we use. Uh, so uh, those benchmarks are run pretty regularly. Uh, and then, uh, uh, yeah, that's basically it. We haven't tested in on production workloads yet, but maybe that would come. I mean, we, we have some, some ways to do this uh, as well. What kind of testing tool did you use? Uh, yeah, NoSQL Bench. So actually, yeah, so officially we use NoSQL Bench, and NoSQL Bench is actually th those results are from NoSQL Bench. I personally, because I'm also part of that team, so I personally also use Lata, which is my tool for just doing some stuff. Uh, and actually, this matched NoSQL Bench very well. So, like confirmation from two different tools. Uh,
Uh, yes, uh, so there is some impact on uh, memory and on heap. And uh, um, like if you really index a lot of, lot of rows, uh, there are some data structures in the indexes that are in memory, uh, also they are loaded in memory. So they are used for accelerating access. So you don't have to touch disk every time. Uh, so yeah, adding a bit more memory for SAI is recommended. Uh, but this should be just a fraction of memory needed generally for, for mem tables. So I, I, I don't have any you know, ballpark number at the moment, but um, I mean, I guess like 10% probably should be enough. Uh, yeah. Sorry. It's less than a thousand. Yeah. <laughs> okay, one more. So are the testing is SI index and like SI on the fiber? Yeah, 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 that's right. Uh, yeah, but vector search and indexing uh, is a bit of a different thing. Like we, we, we of course, use uh, SAI in vector search, but there are still some areas that need to be um, solved. Uh, and we are currently working on this. So that's why we try to be conservative and like just don't, don't let people run into you know problematic area. Okay, we ran out of time. So thank you again for coming.